1985, John Fogarty had an album that was called Center Field. And in that album, or on that album, was a particular song, and it was Put Me In, Coach. Anybody remember that song? Put Me In, Coach, and the chorus begins this way. Oh, put me in, Coach. I'm ready to play today. I don't know if any of you were athletes in your previous life. That's how I look at it with me. Because when I was an athlete, I was half the man I am now. Literally. But I was uh, a bit of an athlete in high school, college. I played baseball, basketball, and I also played uh, some other chasing games. Do you know what I mean there? Like chasing the girls? Yeah. But I, I did a lot of that. I was an athlete, and I was a pretty decent athlete. I was all state in baseball. I was honorable, all mentioned, all state in basketball. And after high school, I played softball, and I was voted the best player in the state of Ohio for two years. It was amazing. I love being an athlete, but you know what? As an athlete, I didn't like. I did not like sitting on the bench. I hated. <laughs> yes, God. I hated sitting on the bench. And I would do anything and everything in practice to make sure that when it came game time, I was not sitting on the bench. And I want to kind of correlate that today to the church. There is not a one of us sitting here today that should want to sit on the bench. We should, every one of us, be saying the same thing that John Fogarty did. The same thing. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today. The series we're doing is the idea of serving. And I get to kick it off. And then Josiah's going to share and Derek's going to share because I think all of us need to talk about what it means to us and for us as we serve in the church together. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, list of the gifts that was given in the church. But I will also tell you that I looked through Scripture, I looked and I looked and I looked, and I couldn't find any Scripture that would say, so Christ himself gave them no gifts. Do you know what that means? We all, three-letter word there, all, we all have gifts. And it's a matter of what we do with them. Ron preached last week about the idea of, of serving through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how it happens. And so today, I want to say there are two areas in our lives that we've been gifted to use and to serve. One is to serve God. The other is to serve people. And we're going to look at both of those today. And I'm going to tell you right now, put your seatbelts on. Because we're going to go through some things very quickly. You're going to get five ways that we need to serve God. And you're going to get seven ways we need to serve other people. And that sounds like a revival series, doesn't it? Last about five nights. We might get through this. We're going to try to get through that this morning, so hang on. A few weeks ago, we studied in the book of Joshua. We studied the man Joshua, and he said, Choose today whom you will serve. He didn't say, Choose today who you will worship, even though that's very important for us to do with God. He said, Choose today whom you will serve. He already had his mind made up that he and his family would serve the Lord. And I want, man, I want us to notice here that he said, as for me and my house, because I believe that the men in this sanctuary today are the spiritual leaders in your homes. We are the ones who need to step up. Listen, if you want to serve the Lord, you got to do it with everything you have. And I love the fact Joshua didn't say, hey, let me go back and talk to Mrs. Joshua before I decide what we're going to do. He didn't do that. He stood up as a leader, the spiritual leader in his house and said, this is what's going to happen. My wife's going to serve. My kids are going to serve. My servants are going to serve. We're all in my house going to serve the Lord. And here's the interesting thing. When you serve God, 
you got to give it all. You got to give it all. There is no part time in serving God. It's all or nothing. And so we've got to learn in our lives that we need to serve God all the time. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So what we see in this verse is when we worship God and we serve God, it needs to be acceptably. Acceptably. How are you serving God today? See, we're, listen, we're here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, let me share with you, we are born to serve. Not naturally, not when we came out of the womb, because the nature of the human is to do just the opposite. But when we, are, when we come into the body of Christ, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we come up out of that water, we come up with a new birth, we are born to serve. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 speaks a lot to that. But in Colossians 3, 24, we find this. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But can I tell you, there are a lot of people trying to do that. They're trying to serve both. You're trying to serve more than one God. Some of you sitting there, well, that's not me, preacher. Well, I'm thrilled to death if it's not you. I'm thrilled to death that God is number one. But there are so many people that claim that God's number one, and yet so many other things come into play in their life. Think about it. You hear about somebody who believes, but yet they're running around. They're doing God's business in the middle of sin. That don't work. We can't be doing God's work in Satan's environment. We've got to be doing God's work, God's way when God wants it. It's crazy when we try to live for God while we're in the middle of sin. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him. Come on, worship the God and serve him. Only. He is the only one we serve. So the question that we're going to answer this morning with God is, What are you doing to serve the Lord? How do I serve the Lord? Have your Bibles. Get them ready. We're going to be jumping through a lot of pages here. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. We're going to talk about how we can serve the Lord. 1 Peter 4, 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him... Be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The first thing we're going to understand here that we've got to serve God with our abilities. How many of you are sitting there right now thinking, I don't have any abilities? If that's the case, you're calling God a liar. Because Scripture teaches us that every one of us have been given abilities. Abilities to use. And he wants us to serve him with those abilities. We're not serving God with material things. I don't serve God with the clothes I wear, the shoes I have, the car I drive, the house I live in. That's not how I serve God. I serve God by what's in here. It's what's on the inside. And God said to serve him with sincerity and service that it is acceptable to him. Now, the interesting thing with this is, your ability that you have to serve God is not my ability necessarily to serve God. Because he has given us all different ways to serve and different abilities to do that. And he gave them to us so that we could glorify him 
to lift up the name of Jesus in everything we do. You know, <laughs> serving God, this is gonna sound kind of crazy, but serving God can be as simple as opening those doors for people to come in. There are people here today, sitting here in this church and have been for some time because of the greeting they received when they came through those doors. We can serve God in multiple ways. And we need to remember that. We serve with the abilities that he's given us. Number two, Matthew chapter 12, verse 44. They gave all out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Number two, you want to serve God? Give him your all. Give him your all. There are so many Christians in the world today, and they're just giving God a little part here and a little part there, and they think that's enough. And they only give when they feel like it. But listen, when I say give all to God, I, I want you to go back to John three sixteen with me. For God so loved the world that he... Ah! We got the greatest example in, in the world right there. God gave his all for you and I. Why in the world would we take anything less to him than our all? We need to give him our all. Have you ever considered just how blessed you would be if you gave God your all? You know, and I, I say that because there are weeks that giving God my all is so simple and so easy, and it's those weeks that I feel more blessed. I may not be more blessed, but I sure feel like it. And then there's weeks that I don't necessarily give God my all. And I will tell you, those are the weeks that I find to be most painful and most discouraging. When we give God our all, he will respond accordingly to that. Number three, John chapter eight, verse 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I believe this phrase here, hold to. Hold to, that's longevity. That is a long time. We're living in a world where there, I'm gonna be honest today, there is a bunch of what I'm gonna call Christian quitters. They come in, they get excited, they're all, all pumped up about serving Jesus, and next thing you know, they're not around. Why? What happened? They quit. They quit on God. They quit on the church. They quit on us. I thank God for saints that I've known for 20 years or even longer who are faithful, the longevity that they have. Back when I was growing up, uh, let's, let's say back in the day, somebody know that phrase, right? That means we're talking for us old people here. But back in the day, in our Sunday school classes at the church that I grew up in, if you attended every week for the year, you got a pin. Anybody remember those days? When you got the Sunday school pins? Oh, we got pins. And one of my uh, friends on Facebook right now, her name is I I Iola Creamer. She's 103 years old. She's on Facebook every day. She and my daughter have conversations every day. Her husband, Jim, was an elder in the church as I was growing up. And there was a special day each year that we were told to wear the pins for Sunday school to let people know how long we've been in Sunday school. His went from his lapel below his belt. 32 years, the man never missed Sunday school. Now, they went on vacation when they were out of town. Okay, that's acceptable. But when he was in town, he was at Sunday school every week. Longevity. A couple others I want to mention that are right here from our church. Olive Chu, mid-90s. Had a little chat with her on Friday. She's still got a little ornery streak in her. She let me know it. But at mid-90s, she is still faithful, very faithful to her God, our God. It's amazing to 
to be of that age and to be that faithful. Yesterday, some of you know, we had a celebration service in here. It was for uh, Mary Beth Schaefer. Mary Beth wasn't necessarily that old. She was only 67. But in these last few years, she had been through a whole lot in the way of health issues and struggles that she had. But as I sat and talked with her before I left for vacation, I had the opportunity to sit with her. We talked about this ser the service that she wanted to have. And it amazed me with everything that she had gone through that she was still so faithful. Longevity, that's what we need in our lives as we serve God. We need to do it. We need to do it when we don't feel like it. You ever have to do something you didn't feel like doing? You know, like getting up in the morning and rolling over and your wife's covered with cold cream and you gotta love her anyway? There are things, listen, we need to do, we need to understand that longevity is a way that we serve God. Here's another way. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And to me that means reliability. Reliability. Always be ready. It's sad to say, but as I was growing up, I would see what I thought were some of the most godly people in the world in the church. But if I saw them outside of the church setting, I just don't think they'd go to church. Do you know people like that? There's nobody in here like that, I know. But there are people who live Sunday, but not the rest of the week. It's amazing. But to serve God, we need to be ready at all times. We need to be ready, not only for the, to give an answer for the hope that we have inside, we need to be ready to invite others into the service and the serving of God that we have. But we gotta be ready all the time, always ready. Here's the next one. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. To me, that's stability. Stability. When we're serving God, we need to be stable. Now, I understand for some of us, some of us, that's pretty difficult to do, isn't it? Some of us aren't stable regardless of what happens in our life. But we need to be stable when serving God. We need to be stable in our prayer life. We need to be stable in our Bible reading. We need to be stable in the time that we spend with our families. We need to be stable in our church attendance. Because you see, when we're stable doing the things to serve God that we're called to do, then he in turn will strengthen us with that. Another word for stability may be consistency. Be consistent in prayer and Bible reading, the time you spend with your family. Be consistent because it means when you are, you're serving God. Proverbs 8, 34 gives us the last. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. Daily. Daily. You know, I think some of us have uh, kind of taken an issue with that term daily because primarily what it means is get up and go to work. That's about the only thing I do every day. Get up and go to work. And so that's created a mindset in us that's not so good. See, we need to understand that daily, Luke tells us, what it looks like, 923, he says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross, hmm, and follow me. It's not a Sunday thing. We need to be celebrating on Sundays 
the things that God has done through the week with us. I'd like to get rid of the sign out front that says worship service at 1030 here at Southport Heights. And I'd like to put up a sign that says celebration. We're having a celebration for God at Southport Heights this week because of all the things that he's done in our lives. Folks, it's not a Sunday thing. When can we serve God? Any time. Where can we serve God? Any where. We need to understand that serving God is anytime, anywhere. Three, it's, it's a, what do they say, 24-7, 365. We can serve God. Now, when we're talking about serving God and we're talking about the abilities that we have, don't try to steal someone else's gift. Use your own. God wants you to do what he wants you to do. You remember in the, the Bible, the story about the man who gave talents to three different servants? And he gave the one talent to the guy and he told him to, to use it and to, to make money with it. And he went away and he buried it because he was scared to death of what the master do to him. And what did the master do when he came back and he hadn't done anything with his money? Took it away. Gave it to the guy with 10 talents. And so that old boy that had the one talent ended up with no talents. You know, I, uh, I think that's a problem today in the church. If you don't use what God has given you, what's going to happen? My dad retired when he was 65. He never left his recliner when he retired. So it's like he was sitting, just waiting to die. And what I noticed about him after he had sat there for so long, he had no strength left in his legs. Why? He didn't use them. He didn't exercise. He couldn't even stand up. In the last week of his life, he wouldn't even get out of bed, even though he could get out of bed but he didn't use what he had, so he lost it. And I want to tell you, if we don't use the gifts that God has given us, we will lose them. And I see a lot of people, I see a lot of Christians in the world today, they're ending up with nothing because they don't use the gifts that God's given. If you do not come to this place, the house of God, to hear his word preached, and if you don't pick up your Bible and read it and study it and know what you have, then instead of having ability, you have a disability. But on the other side of that, we all know people who when we call them and ask them to pray for us, what are they going to do? Hello. What are they going to do? They're going to pray. There are people you know that you can call and they're going to pray because you asked them to. You know, there are people who are going to pick up a phone and call you and tell you that they love you. There are people who are going to pick up the phone and just find out how you're doing. And yet I have seen people come and go here at Southport Heights. And the comment that I hear is, well, um, I'm not getting anything from church. Can I just say something this morning and just be as mean and nasty as I can be? If you can't get something from the Lord here at Southport Heights Christian Church, you're not going to find it anywhere else. This place is full of the Spirit of God. And if you don't see it, you don't feel it, you don't sense it, then maybe the issue is not whether the Spirit's here or not. Maybe the issue is more about where I am. Am I attuned with what God is doing? So I don't think it's the issue of the Spirit of God. It's, is it where, am I where I should be in my Christian walk? Serving God. Gave you five quick things. Now the seven things we're going to do for serving others is going to be even quicker. Ready? If your husband or fiancé, boyfriend, whatever, goes out shopping for presents this afternoon, would you prefer that they make a purchase at a jewelry store or at Walmart. 
Yeah, see, I got some conversation going now, don't I? You know, I'm pretty certain that Joan would rather have a pair of diamond earrings than she would a vacuum cleaner. You know, I mean, that's just kind of normal, right? Because in general, we prefer gifts that will make us feel good about ourselves rather than gifts that'll help us do chores around the house. However, when we read through Scripture, in particular with the Apostle Paul, he encourages us to seek spiritual gifts, but spiritual gifts more of the Walmart kind of gifts. In other words, we're to seek gifts that'll help us serve and not strut. Do you pray for spiritual gifts? I think that one of the reasons maybe that we don't pray more often for spiritual gifts is because we don't know what to ask for. See, the, the, the Corinthian Christians, they didn't have any problem with that. They knew what they wanted and they prayed for it. But however, with them, there was a problem. They wanted these gifts because they felt it would set them apart from ordinary Christians. They wanted to be of, over them. They saw their fellow believers as competitors to step over, to step on, and not a companion to serve with. Things haven't changed a whole lot, have they, in the church over 2,000 years? I've seen it many times when, when one member will propose a differing view than another member. And when they do that, they become competitors rather than companions to serve. The gifts that God has given you and me not only are to serve him, but they are for the purpose of serving others. And like most things that you'll find for sale at Walmart, your gifts need to be used to serve others. To serve your siblings, serve your neighbors, serve your classmates, serve your coworkers. And in serving others, you will demonstrate the love of God. The greatest act of love that we find that Jesus did prior to the cross was when he was on his hands and knees washing the feet of the disciples. Service is about love. And that's what we want to do. We want to show off God's love. So how should we serve? Let's serve like Jesus did. Can we agree to that? We want to serve like Jesus served? All right. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. I once heard a parable trying to explain the difference between heaven and hell. There are tables set up in each venue. Beautiful tables set up. And on there was the pot of the most magnificent stew you can ever imagine eating. But in order to eat it, you had to eat it with a five-foot spoon. And you had to hold it on the end. You know what happened? In hell, they all got their spoons full, and they tried their very best to get that into their mouth to eat. And what happened? They couldn't get it there. But in heaven, what they did is they picked up a spoonful of food, and they reached across the table to feed the person across from them. So when that happened, then everybody was filled. The difference between heaven and hell. Now, I know that's not a good parable. I understand that. And it's not an accurate parable. But it is pretty much where we are today. Two different approaches to life, folks. We all have needs. But when we focus exclusively, exclusively on our needs, we miss out. But when we focus on serving one another, we all end up receiving what we need. And this is how God established the kingdom to work. We know that Jesus didn't come to this earth to be served. He came to serve. But we also know in, from Philippians that we're supposed to be like Jesus in that regard. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. 
in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Hello. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. You see, I think sometimes we lose how serving God comes about. Let's just look at the cross. Two beams on the cross, right? One vertical, one horizontal. The vertical one reconciles us to Christ. The, ver the horizontal reconciles us to each other. The best way to serve God is to serve each other. We're called to serve one another as Jesus served us. So let me give you those seven ways very quickly. Jesus served in a variety of ways. He served in a variety of ways, depending on the person, the need, the desire, the faith, the situation, and his Father's will. At times he taught crowds, at other times he physically fed masses. He preached to the many, he also poured his life into the few. Serving as Jesus would serve means that we must meet people where they are, serve them according to their need. Our job is to be attentive to the working of God and the needs of people. There is no formula to serve like Jesus served. There's only the example that he gave us. So we serve in a variety of ways. Number two, we serve holistically. Holistically. God cares about more than just our souls. He cares about us as people in all dimensions of our life. Listen, Jesus served people holistically, physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially. He met needs of the person, not just the soul. Number three, serving as Jesus served means we need to serve compassionately. Compassionately. Listen, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion and love for people motivated Jesus in everything he did. And it's not only about a feeling of compassion. It's about the action that follows. Compassion should always lead to action. We need to serve compassionately with those around us. Number four, we need to serve selflessly. Selflessly. I like Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. One of the most significant markers of serving like Jesus is to do it with humility. Serve selfishly. Number five, serve graciously. Serve graciously. Luke 6.35 says, but love your enemies and do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Can I just say, ouch? This is a hard one, folks. This is very hard. But perhaps more than the other way of serving others, this is probably the one that reflects the heart of God the most. Think about it. This is the core of the gospel message. Loving our friends is easy. Loving our enemies and doing good to them. Well, that's not so easy. Especially when you have to expect nothing in return. But we need to remember, while we were yet sinners, God loved us. And so we must do the same. Number six, we need to serve intentionally. It just doesn't happen. You have to be intentional. John 12, 26 says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, and my servants will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. It requires a perseverance to follow Jesus. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional in understanding where he's leading us, and then we need to serve the way he has called us to serve. Look around to see what he's blessing and how you can serve in the blessing he's providing. Because so many times we say, no, nah, I want to do this, so God, you come and bless this. Don't happen that way. We're not God. He is. And we need to serve intentionally. And lastly, we need to take time for people. 
take time for people. Matthew chapter 20 said, The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them, What do you want me to do for you? Have you ever known anyone that's so busy, or maybe they have the attitude that they're just so important, they're just too busy for other people? Maybe sometimes you've even given that off, that vibe off yourself. I'm just too busy. We don't see people in need because we're too busy. I think we need to understand that Jesus' ministry on earth for three years was a ministry of what I'm going to say is distractions. He would be going somewhere to accomplish something, and then he would see a need, and what did he do? He came over to meet the need, and then he went back to accomplish what he had in his mind to do. Folks, we, gotta, we just can't be so busy that we miss what God's called us to do and how he's called us to serve others. You see, Jesus didn't serve when he arrived where he was going. He served as he went. He took time for people. He delayed his own plans to serve people in need. Over the course of the next few weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. Serving people. We're going to be talking specifically about the ministries we have here in the church. Some of them are about serving in the church with the people that are here and what we can do. Others are going to be serving in the community and how you can meet the needs of people there. But we're talking about serving. Getting in the game. Getting off of the bench. Now, I will tell you that I know that there are a lot of people here that serve. And some of you have three, four, five hats on when you're serving. I understand that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. But there are others. For some reason, you like sitting on the bench. When we have this ministry fair, you're going to have an opportunity to get off the bench and to get in the game and become a very valuable player for Southport Heights Christian Church. Because if not the volunteers to take care of the ministries of this church, we would not be here. It would be gone. Volunteers and those who serve are Southport Heights Christian Church.